So it brings me great pleasure uh, to introduce to you tonight, Dr. Drew Harville. Uh, she is a Emeritus Professor of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at Cornell University. Her primary courses were Marine Ecosystem Sustainability and Invertebrate Biology. She taught at Cornell and at Friday Harbor Labs on San Juan Island. Mm -hmm. Her research has taken her from the reefs of Mexico, Indonesia, and Hawaii to the Pacific Northwest. She earned her Bachelor of Science and Mas Master of Science in Zoology at the University of Alberta and her PhD at the University of Washington. She's oh. just being introduced. Oh, sorry, Peter, if you could uh, mute yourself there. Uh, Dr. Harville has received multiple awards for her work and is the author or co-author of well over 100 academic articles. She is also the author of two books, A Sea of Glass, about her work as curator of Cornell University's collection of detailed sculptures of marine creatures. Her latest book, Ocean mm -hmm. Outbreak, Confronting the Rising Tide of Marine Disease, is what we are going to be hearing a little more about tonight. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to you, Drew. Uh, for people, if you can hold your questions in the chat uh, or put them in the chat or hold them until breaks for questions. And also, if possible, if you can turn your video off for the presentation, that would be wonderful. Over to you, Drew. Appreciate All right. Thank you so much, Joan, for inviting me. And thank you all. What a great turnout. It's really, really exciting that you're all here uh, to hear this. And um, I hope you'll have a chance to ask questions as we go along. Uh, boy, I'd sort of like to hear those Fraser River uh, mm -hmm. films, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, okay, I think we have a couple of people who might not be muted. So please, um, please mute your, um, mute your mics if you can. What I'm going to talk about tonight, uh, disease outbreaks in the ocean, in particular a focus on how some of this is heating up with climate change. My, uh, my work is based largely pretty much in your waters. Um, uh, I'm at Friday Harbor Labs in the San Juan Islands. And so we share this Salish Sea, which is of enormous importance to all of us, certainly um, to me. So one of the reasons why I took on writing this book is because we've been studying uh, outbreaks, not just in humans, but also in ocean animals. And we've been finding that essentially all levels of oceanic biota are affected by infectious diseases uh, from essential marine habitats to keystone predators. Now I'm an ecologist. So the kinds of um, biological interactions I study are almost always things that are ecologically important, whether they're major habitat forming taxa like corals or eelgrasses or keystone predators like sea stars. Um, and in addition to just this wide range of organisms that are affected by outbreaks, such as shown in the cartoons here, there's a lot of processes. And as you'll see tonight, uh, there's examples of food chains being completely disrupted by the outbreaks among the organisms affected. Uh, unfortunately, some of our very own biota are on the edge of endangerment and um, are being listed for extinction um, based on uh, disease outbreaks. There are both human and environmental causes. And the bottom line for why do, one reason to talk about this and to write this book is to be thinking about how do we up our game? How do we better manage these ecosystems and uh, what are some of our, our uh, new approaches we can be developing? And so at the end, I'll come back to talking about that. Now I'm a research scientist and the focus of my lab now is the ecology of host pathogen interactions. And in addition to uh, the dynamics and the, the back and forth and the ups and downs, uh, we also just see these as sentinels of change in ecological interactions. And I'll talk about that more, um, particularly from the standpoint of the sea star wasting and the, uh, the eelgrass work that I'm gonna talk about. But um, as ecologist, I always study the host and the pathogen, but in an environmental context. And 
the environmental context I'm going to be talking about tonight, of course, is climate change uh, and a warming environment. The kinds of hosts that I've worked with primarily are corals, seagrasses, and sea stars. Uh, the pathogens range the gamut from protozoans to viruses to bacteria. Uh, and of course, uh, we're interested in how a changing environment can uh, increase the risk uh, or change the risk of disease in these cases. Um, so what I want to talk about today, I'll just give a little background about how infectious epidemics in the ocean may be increasing with warming, other than the really specific examples I'm going to talk about. I'll talk about outbreaks in eelgrass meadows and among sea star wasting uh, along the entire coast. I mean, it's pretty impressive. Both of these, what are essentially pandemics because they expand beyond even the borders of our two countries uh, affect the entire west coast um, of our of our um, of our coastlines, and then I'll finish off by talking about ways we may be able to improve ocean health with ecosystem services. Um, so I'm going to focus tonight on sea stars and seagrasses, but there's a whole bunch of other critters that are affected by diseases that increase with warming. Um, corals, of course, are probably the poster child for this. Um, probably many of you know that our coral reefs are being heavily impacted by warming oceans now, causing uh, what, what would, what, what's a physiological change, a bleaching, a change, a loss in the, in the symbiotic algae, but also a much higher rate of um, disease, such as shown here on this this coral head here, this black zone is actually a disease. The white here is the zone of coral that has actually died. And on the other side here is our healthy coral. But there's other organisms. There's, um, there's abalone that have been affected by temperature sensitive diseases, oysters, lobsters, and turtles. Um, and some of the work that we've done, for example, this paper uh, talks about developing ways to use uh, remote sensing and satellite data to actually project the risk of disease with changing temperatures. This was um, actually kind of a, an interesting case study of uh, lobsters on the east coast of the US uh, where warming conditions are making them more susceptible to disease and it's gonna eventually be impacting our main uh, lobster industry, which is actually a really big uh, fishery. Um, now, I often get asked, well, is this a new problem or how would we know? And the problem is we don't actually have base, what we would call baselines for marine disease. We don't really know what the levels have been historically. And so this was a PhD student working in my lab, Allison Tracy. And what she did is she went back uh, through the literature and developed a comprehensive literature search to establish baselines for all these different marine groups um, and from urchins to seagrasses to fish. And what's plotted here is this is just the uh, proportion of the literature on fish for the last um, uh, 40 years from 1970 to 2013 that's about diseases that are occurring in the wild. And so you can see it's about 5% of the fish, um, fish literature. And so we can use this to establish a baseline. And what she further found with corals, even though the reports uh, over that 40 year period are, are kind of a small fraction, is that the reports of infectious coral disease are increasing over 40 years. And at least in the Caribbean, they were able to, to link it with changes in the warming. And so this is one way to kind of go back and develop baselines. So for at least one group, uh, we can talk about there being an increase uh, through time that's linked with warming. Um, uh, I'm not gonna say a lot more about coral disease outbreaks, although it's something that I have studied uh, worldwide. Uh, right now we're facing some pretty dire conditions in the Caribbean uh, related with warming. There's a new disease outbreak called stony coral tissue loss disease. Um, some of us call it skittle D. 
And unfortunately, this gives you a picture of how quickly it spreads. So here's one coral head here. You can see there's just a couple of lesions in 2019. Um, a month later, this entire colony has been virtually killed um, by uh, this bacterial uh, outbreak. And so unfortunately, this particular disease has spread um, pretty much Caribbean wide and um, is causing is causing a lot of damage. So again, it's just one example of the importance we're finding of some of these infectious conditions in our oceans. Um, I want to talk about examples that are closer to home. Uh, this is um, a disease outbreak that's affected some of our most charismatic of marine invertebrates. And I'm guessing, I can't see all of your faces, but um, if I could, uh, I, well, actually a lot of you are blacked out now I can see, but um, I'm guessing that a lot of people here experienced um, uh, some of the effects of this big outbreak. Uh, this is a picture that was taken um, by Neil McDaniel. And on October 9th of 2013 at Croker Island on Indian Arms. So this is in Canadian waters. And virtually uh, 20 days later on October 29th, all of these stars perished. Uh, and this is basically the residue um, from the spicules from the um, decaying bodies from the star. It's a pretty gruesome picture. Um, many of you will remember that the sunflower star used to be one of our most abundant. I'm sure there's at least some divers in the group. Um, one of the most abundant of our subtitle stars in our waters and then all the way into California. Uh, this was the beginning of the sea star wasting disease outbreak. Uh, we've been studying it since the beginning uh, and we continue to work on it. And I just want to give you an update about it. Um, it's classified among marine ecologists and pathologists as the largest marine wildlife epidemic or panzootic as we call it, if it's an animal and not a, not a person, not humans. Uh, it started in 2013 or 2015, depending on where you were on the coast. For example, Alaska, Alaska was phased in a little bit later. Uh, sadly, it's continuing. And one of the reasons why it's considered the largest outbreak is the number of species that were affected. There were over 20 of our local sea star species affected. Of course, everybody here probably knows the sunflower star. And of course, you know, the ochre star, which also uh, suffered very heavy mortalities. Um, in addition to being beautiful and interesting, these are also ecologically important. And I'm going to talk about some of the impacts that we've experienced based on the decline, particularly of the sunflower star. Um, there was a lot of press at the time. Um, some of our work showed that there were warming links uh, associated with the intensity of these infections and the intensity of the mortality. And rather than talk you through a lot of data that we've already published, I really love showing this video and I hope it's going to come through okay. This is something that was actually done ag again um, on uh, your side of the border. Uh, this video um, abstract, we call it, was developed by the Hackeye Institute uh, and about equal numbers of Canadian and American uh, co-authors are on this paper. Uh, so I'm going to run this talking about sort of the realization of the intense uh, impact to this one species. There's an epidemic in the ocean. Since 2013, a viral disease has been turning sea stars in the Northeast Pacific into melted piles of goo. Of the 20 or so species of sea stars affected by the virus, one of the hardest hit were sunflower stars. Until now, we haven't known just how bad the decline was, but new research has begun to reveal the longer term continental scale impact of the epidemic on certain species. Scientists in the U.S. are now suggesting we formally list the once common sunflower star as an endangered species. Trained citizen science divers from California to Alaska counted sunflower stars on over 11,000 dives, while scientific divers from the Hakai Institute carried out more detailed surveys on the BC Central Coast. When they looked at all the data, scientists noticed something in common where they saw outbreaks of the virus, anomalously warm water. 
We still don't know how these warm water anomalies in the virus interact, but researchers say these warmer than normal water temperatures were related to dramatic sea star declines. While divers can patrol waters near the surface, we didn't know whether sunflower sea stars might have found refuge at deeper depths. But thousands of NOAA bottom trawl surveys have revealed that when it comes to sunflower stars, the disease didn't stay in the shallows. For example, data from Washington State shows a crash in populations in both shallow nearshore and deep offshore environments after the epidemic began in 2013. <laughs> data from other areas on the coast are similar, with population declines of as much as 80 to 100 percent in areas across the 3,000 kilometers from Alaska to California. <laughs> sea stars may appear to be the I'm going to I'm going to stop that video now. It is online if anybody wants to to um, check in on that later. That was just to give you kind of a snapshot of the work that we did using uh, citizen science. And if any of you were involved in the reef diving, you may have participated in some of the data we used to just document thoroughly the decline of the sunflower star. Um, and now I'm going to say a little bit about the ecological importance of it. So again, this is a different um, a different data set. This is the California uh, Reef Citizen Science um, data. And again, it goes back to 2007. So the value of this citizen science data taken by um, recreational divers uh, is that it gives us a long time series preceding the outbreak uh, to show how anomalous it was that these stars essentially went to zero. They've always been a dominant part of our subtital assemblages. It's gone to zero and it's stayed there and this continues. In fact, it's gotten worse. Um, what happened though is sort of an ecological domino effect. Um, as the predatory star diminished, the prey, the sea urchins have jumped up in numbers. Now, sea urchins are really great critters. It's not like we don't like them, but the problem is when they explode in high numbers, they then eat all of the plants that they like, and those plants are kelp beds. So we've been finding in a number of places, this has particularly been a problem in California, um, uh, where the urchins have overwhelmed their kelp beds, but I know this also happened um, briefly in Howe Sound uh, and exploded. And so, this has become a management issue uh, in, in, our, in our waters. So this has led to the development of a Pycnopodia recovery plan. And I've been very privileged to work with the Seattle Aquarium and the Nature Conservancy California and some other uh, about 60 scientists um, to figure out one, what are some of the causes of the epidemic? What can we do about it? and how can we recover this really dominant part of our marine ecosystem. Um, I was really happy to hear from Joan that Jason Hodeen came last year and talked about his captive breeding program. So uh, this is successfully underway under Jason's leadership at Friday Harbor Labs. He's got quite a, quite a collection now of stars that he's been breeding. The hope is that we will put those back in the ocean. Um, at the same time, um, our group prepared uh, the listing as imperiled with the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. NOAA has now picked that up, and I believe in December, this is sunflower star is going to be listed as an endangered species in the U.S., which is almost inconceivable to us that it would come to that. Um, but they are very rare now in our waters. Um, uh, I guess that's all I want to say about that. Sorry. One of the things uh, that's become a real priority is understanding the causative agent, what microbe is responsible for this disease that's continuing. And I, I did mean to say that we had a new resurgence of it this fall. Of course, you know that this was an unusually warm fall, right? We had insanely warm September and early October, uh, and um, that's caused uh, a resurgence in levels of the wasting disease, not just for the sunflower star, but also for our ochre star and some of our intertidal stars. Uh, so um, early evidence suggested that the causative agent was a virus. And um, uh, these scientists, Alyssa Gaiman, Grace Crandall, 
uh, are working with us and the Hakai Institute to kind of nail down the causative, um, causative agent. And these are experiments that are being done um, at a fish virus lab in, in Washington state. Uh, and essentially what we found this year is that um, when uh, stars are injected with the crude extract or a salomic fluid of, of, a, of a sick individual uh, that they become infected. So this is a way of confirming that this is an infectious disease um, and the heat killed controls remain asymptomatic and aren't showing any signs. So now work is underway to use these samples to explore uh, the signature of the causative agent. And we're also very interested in how are some of these stars being resistant? We that there's the possibility of with the captive breeding developing um, a breeding of resistant stars, uh, and so that's become another focus of this of this project. So uh, this is part of the team of scientists that are hard at work um, as part of this recovery plan for the sunflower star. I'm going to pause now. This is kind of the first third of my talk uh, and just kind of summarize some of the take homes. I went over this pretty quickly and I realized some of you may have followed this along in the early stages of the epidemic. Others of you, you know, may not know some of the history. So I wanna take a, a few minutes for questions. Uh, what we're finding now, the epidemic continues. There was significant mortality this fall. Uh, among some of our very common stars, the ochre star, uh, the mottled star, and the sunflower star. Uh, as I said, the sunflower star is now currently listed as endangered by the IUCN, and we're expecting the listing uh, from NOAA, in our country at least, uh, in December. Uh, there's a continued concern for kelp beds and the need for urchin control. Uh, there is a successful captive breeding program at Friday Harbor Labs, and we have new, un new work underway to identify the causative microbe. And so I'll take a minute if um, you want to post questions in the chat, maybe. Uh, and I think Joan said she would field those, or if you have another way you want to ask your questions. Um, at least it's been, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's okay to if um, if you wanted to unmute yourself to ask a question, but then just remember to mute yourself again. Um, from Sheila, she would she said dates of papers mentioned, please. Whoa, that's is that a big question? Uh, uh, the two thousand nineteen paper is the one that I showed the video for, and that was the one uh, that was pretty influential in getting this whole listing started. Uh, so that's a 2019 paper and um, science advances. And uh, I'd be happy to send those along later, or a lot of them are on my website. Okay. Um, I still have a, a, a question that it's sort of like the devil's advocate question here. Uh, the... The sunflower stars, that picture that Neil McDaniel had from Croker Island, uh, there were a lot of sunflower stars there. And, and of course, they've been the hardest hit. Would there have anything to do with, um, I mean, yeah, the warming and it was probably a virus, but a little bit of an overpopulation issue as well? You know, that's a, that's a really good question. And um, that was certainly... Uh, something that a lot of people focused on, especially in those waters where there were so many. But remember, uh, the uh, the level of this outbreak is from San Diego all the way up to, well, from mid-California all the way to Alaska. So there were a lot of places where the numbers were actually really very low uh, that they also, um, uh, also experienced this epidemic. Now, did it start under conditions where the populations were very high? we can't really, you know, answer that question. It certainly could be a possibility um, that, you know, it's part of a, a part of a regulation and nature issue, but it's a very atypical outbreak. Um, oops, I saw I froze up for a minute. I'll, I'm going to repeat. It's a very atypical outbreak in the sense that there's such a wide range of sea stars affected with over 20 species. 
We call that a multi-host pathogen when it affects um, not just one species, but a whole bunch like that. Uh, and none of the previous bouts of disease and sea stars that have been studied had such a wide range as that. So it, it, it definitely is a very unusual uh, uh, outbreak from that standpoint. And also the, the geographic range. Again, we've never seen anything on the scale of continental scale before. Of course, as humans, we're experiencing something like this. Um, I, I bet you realize that COVID is also a multi-host pathogen. It's not just affecting humans, it's affecting, there's been reports of, of, of um, wild cat affected, domestic cats affected, mink, um, bats are presumably the original host species. So uh, these multi-host pathogens that affect a bunch of different species can really be pretty damaging. Yeah. Any so more questions? Yeah. Yeah, there's a couple popping up here. Uh, one sure. from uh, Peter Bellin. He would like to know to what depth does the warming extend? Um, you know, there's been some really interesting work actually done in BC waters showing some remarkably deep warming uh, events uh, in some of the deep waters and some of the fjords. And so uh, while the the uh, the biggest extent of the warming is in shallow waters. Um, there have been certainly some records of deep water warming as well. And um, I don't know how quickly that um, graph went past uh, in the video, but um, one of the things we had in that 2019 paper was our NOAA, NOAA bottom trawl data showing that even as deep as a thousand feet, uh, the the Pycnopodia were experiencing very high mortality and declines. And so uh, we were able to rule out that they hadn't just gone to deeper water, which is something we, we, we initially thought. Um, and it's something we wonder about with some of the intertidal stars when they disappear from the intertidal, it could be that they've gone deeper and we, we can't always confirm that. Yeah. All right, so another question here from uh, John. Is there any evidence that our province of BC or federal government is engaged in supporting research or mitigation of these sea star viruses? Um, well, I guess you'll, I, I don't know of any. Uh, I don't know of any uh, federal or um, provincial programs focused um, on uh, on it. I have to say, though, that an incredibly valuable partner in our work is the Hakai Institute, which is, um, uh, which is located in BC and is a sort of a private research institute. And um, they've been vital uh, in some of the work that we've been doing. Okay, and Sheila, you had a question. Just go ahead. Thank you. I think I'm on. Yes. Um, actually, I, I just wanted to comment when I uh, read about the sunflowers at those 1000 foot depths. Um, it made me, you know, kind of rethink things in the sense that it's not unusual for crabs to migrate from near shore to deeper depths for reproductive or overwintering and coming back for reproduction. So that I found pretty interesting in itself. Uh, but secondly, just to go back to that um, concept of uh, uh, that Joan had noted with superabundance of the sunflowers in the House Sound Indian Arm area, because I also uh, know a diver who was saying it was like layering of sunflowers, one on top of the other. And so from there, I'm thinking that um, echinoderms in general are carry, carry a lot of um, now uh, uh, pathogens, perhaps. I'm not sure if I'm using the right term there. Normally, whether it's sea urchins or sea stars. So with or without this disease, there, I guess, is there potential for such abundance actually then uh, becoming more of a problem because their the population is so large. Is that making sense? Mm -hmm. um, 
actually I'm, I'm not I'm not sure uh I think um you know these populations definitely fluctuate up and down um if you look at the other citizen science data though the the numbers in California at least weren't weren't unusually high um nor were they in Washington and so it, it definitely you did had some very high numbers uh in uh up into house sound and uh croaker arm but you know not across the range mm -hmm. so yeah, mm -hmm. it's hard to say so it's kind of circumstantial in that sense i guess yeah i mean i think it's a question we certainly certainly are interested in it it was uh it was one of i don't have time to show the data but uh there was a very extensive um, analysis of the effects of density in the ochre star because of course we had better data because it's in our title. Um, there were there were literally uh, hundreds of sites uh, and there was no correlation between the level of mortality and the sort of the pre the pre epidemic density of the ochre star. So um, it's hard, you know. I think it's a, it's an open question. It's a great question. It's just it's one yep. we can't quite answer but um, in, sorry i was going to say am i am i correct that echinoderms in general do carry um a, a certain load of uh, and I, I don't know what term to use virus pathogens something like that but but that they they're not they're not always affected by it i i, I don't know if that's kind of characteristic of many animals it is it is out you put your finger on it uh if you kind of think back to that cartoon i showed when i talked a little bit about the the book that i've written it's true of it's true of all of us right we carry mm -hmm. we carry opportunistic potentially path pathogenic things around with us all the time and um it, it's a change in conditions or genetics or the environment that can cause can cause these things to kind of explode. Mm -hmm. So echinoderms wouldn't be unusual in carrying some pathogens that had been opportunistic and then for some reason changed. I mean, just to kind of give a recent example, I mean, everybody's probably familiar with the range of different pathogenic strains in the COVID, for example, there's Omicron and Delta. And, you know, some of those strains are relatively innocuous, and then some of them are much more lethal and transmissible. So mm -hmm. in that sense, but I think I, I probably should stop the questions on the sea stars at this point, and um, I'm going to move on, but I can come back uh, and answer more as we go along. That's great. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, thanks for the good questions. Um, you're, you're out there and thinking good. <laughs> Um, okay, I'm going to switch gears. Uh, this is probably our biggest project right now. And uh, one of the reasons it's one of our biggest projects is I think it's it's one of our most important just because this habitat is so vital for our waters. I think I, I'm guessing probably this audience is pretty familiar with the concept that uh, our salmon and orcas are utterly dependent on eelgrass meadows because these are the nursery areas for uh, the small forage fish that the salmon feed on. These are the nursery areas for young salmon. So they're a vital uh, uh, link in the chain of survival for um, a lot of the uh, higher level biota we care about, as well as having incredible um, superpowers uh, other than just being nursery areas. And so, our eelgrass meadows are essential herring spawning habitat. They're essential juvenile salmon habitat. They uh, mitigate some of the impacts of climate warming because these are plants. They love to absorb carbon dioxide and lock it up into their sediments. And then at the end, I'm gonna talk about a, a sort of a new discovery we've made about how seagrasses can actually reduce some pathogens and maybe affect disease risk for not just corals, but maybe also humans. So I'll come come back to that. So that's so. If I sound like I'm getting excited, I I do think this work is important. Um, however, like almost everything else on land and in the ocean, it does have uh, its its disease agents, and this is what uh, the protozoan that we study 
does to an eelgrass. It, um, it eats away all the chloroplasts and creates these white zones. The black is actually the seagrass, the eelgrass fighting back. So we have these, get these very characteristic lesions. It's caused by something we know. This is an easier study system than the sea star because we can culture and um, uh, do the experiments we need to. It's called labyrinthial zostery. It's a protozoan. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about how prevalent it is on a continental scale, and then uh, how the disease can vary with latitude and, and warming. Um, this is what it looks like. So again, nice, this is something we can see. You can put it under a microscope, uh, these uh, little cells in the protozoan move, they lay down these mucus networks and the cells slide along in the mucus network, both in a culture like this, but also inside our seagrass. This is a histological slide. Here's those spindle shaped cells and here's the little mucus network they've been laying down. Um, and so this is something every one of my undergrads can uh, isolate and culture from a sick eelgrass blade. So it's quite a manipulable uh, disease agent in that sense, which is for us a good thing. Oops, sorry. Hmm, come on, there we go. Uh, we've, put, we've put a lot of time in the last decade into diagnostics. We wanna be sure that uh, we're, we're correctly identifying the causative agent in this case. Uh, that causes these lesions. Uh, we do extensive field surveys. This is my colleague, Maya Groner, who's been working with us almost for a decade on this too. Um, she's doing a field survey and trying to decide whether this lesion is caused by this disease agent or not. And so the way we decide is we culture it, we do histology, we create slides, we do molecular tests, uh, and now more recently we're doing some sequencing. So uh, we have a pretty good handle on the identity of this. Here's your chance to kind of look at what we're confronted with when we're collecting our, uh, our eelgrass and trying to decide if it's healthy or not. That one's pretty easy. You can see those characteristic lesions. This one, we had to do some work to be sure that we knew this was an, this is an early stage of that same, um, same disease. But this is just a little bit of um, desiccation. This plant just got overheated. So uh, we had to learn that these kind of muddy changes uh, were not uh, caused by a disease. Uh, and so that's kind of, that's the sort of the work that we've been doing as the background for this. Uh, we've developed molecular tests. This is a PhD student, Morgan Eisenlord and one of my colleagues, Colleen Burge. They've developed uh, a molecular test and so we really didn't know when we started this work wh whether these different conditions were all the same disease. And so what you can see is very high levels in these solid lesions. These are the early disease stage when they're just loaded, packed with cells. And as the disease becomes older, there's fewer and fewer cells in them. Uh, the, the green asymptomatic tissue in fact is clean, which, which was great. Um, so then we do experiments like this. This is a case where we actually inoculate plants with pure cultures and we're able to create different genetic strains, sort of as if we had an Omicron and a Delta and a Gamma of, of COVID. We have Omicrons and Deltas and Gammas of, of this particular disease that affects our uh, eelgrass. Here's what it looks like at day five, day 12, and day 20. So uh, we're able to study the phenology of how this happens. And then um, at three days, this is the levels in our molecular test. And by 20 days, these are the levels. So this is sort of how we go about doing the background work. Um, boy, it's never uh, in the world of disease ecology, uh, things are always changing. So this is what our characteristic lesions look like at the beginning. Then actually working at Quadra and uh, up into up onto Calvert uh, in BC waters with our Hackeye team, we discovered some new looking infections. These are kind of completely different looking, uh, but they're also caused by the same agent, but a different genetic strain. And so our big study now is really to figure out 
um, how these different strains are interacting with our plants in nature. We've been monitoring our populations since 2013. And this is some kind of bad news. Uh, so these are uh, five of our sites in the San Juan Islands. And this was um, the density of the eelgrass at the beginning. And uh, this is 2021. So you can see that virtually all of these eelgrass meadows have declined in density through time. Um, 2016 was um, coming off a really hot year. Uh, and this is the percent of plants with the disease. And so you can see that these disease levels spiked for several years. Um, and so we think some of the decline in density is due to the high levels of disease that these populations have been experiencing. Um, because it wasn't just our waters, we also found Puget Sound, uh, Quadra, and even up to Calvert Island, which is, those are relatively pristine conditions. Uh, we were finding significant levels of this disease. So we decided we really wanted to do an entire West Coast analysis of the levels of this. In order to do that, we had to develop an artificial intelligence program uh, that could actually correctly diagnose these lesions. And I'm not gonna go into the detail of how we did it. It's actually super cool that this is a machine language learning program. It's essentially artificial intelligence um, uh, that, that, that we had to train over several years to be able to do this. But using that, um, we were, we've been able over the last four years to do simultaneously sur surveys from San Diego all the way up to Alaska. This is um, Lillian Aoki, who's the postdoc that was brilliant in this project and really oversaw a lot of the data analysis. And what this showed is that uh, irrespective of where you are, the positive temperature anomalies were related with um, higher levels of disease. Um, now the different colors here are the different regions. And for example, I'm pretty sure this is, um, it's not showing up here. I'm pretty sure this is either Alaska, BC or Washington. These were the sites, our Northern sites had the most atypical warm weather. And we also had the highest levels of disease at those sites. So um, under both um, measures, we found that these positive temperature anomalies were associated with higher levels of disease, um, even though, so we can't just use um, uh, um, just the straight level of, of temperature, right? Because of course it's warmer in San Diego and mid California than it is in the San Juans. Um, and so that's why we're actually using um, local positive temperature anomalies. How anomalously warm was the water in these areas? And when the water is anomalously warm, we get higher levels of disease. I hope I made that clear now. <laughs> Sorry, it took me a minute to kind of spit that out. Um, there we go. Um, uh, we, were all, we also found that uh, it was actually the anomalies in spring that could predict disease severity and lesion area um, at the time of our surveys in July. And so again, this is just more data um, over the entire range showing uh, the linkages with warming. Um, now we also did um, lab studies and showed that under warmer conditions, the lesions grew faster. So it, it wasn't a complete surprise to find this from the field data, but it was important to see that over a wide geographic range. Now, of course, everybody on this call will remember this uh, that happened um, in um, 2021. This was the extreme heating effect. And I mean, it was just shocking what happened in BC, but even uh, my house is right here uh, in this little bay on San Juan Island. And I recorded temperatures of 103 degrees on my deck, which has never happened before. Um, and so we're experiencing these huge uh, warming events. And this just shows on June 21, um, kind of how this, how this built up to that warming event. You can just see um, over time how this built up. 
And of course, you will all probably remember this happening because it was pretty shocking. Um, so these are the kinds of conditions that um, our nearshore habitats are experiencing. And as part of the study, we've been doing drone footage. And so I'm gonna just show you a couple of our drone maps from 2019, 2020, and 2021. This is Beach Haven, which is one of the sites that experienced very high changes in density, very, very big loss. Um, this is the landward side here. So um, in 2019, we had a complete um, subtidal and intertidal eelgrass meadows. Um, it started to thin out in 2020. By 2021, all six of our transects were completely bare of all eelgrass. So we had a catastrophic loss of the intertidal eelgrass. Same thing happened at the site, uh, at a site we call uh, July 4th Beach. We went from a fairly lush eelgrass meadow in 2019 to extensive areas of bare ground. Um, so, and then just to show you one more time, this is again, the drone footage. Here's shore. Here's actually our transects. Uh, so in the second year, we had already lost some of the cover, um, but we still had our deep water one. Um, after that heat dome, virtually all of the eelgrass was gone. Um, so some of that's caused by disease, some of it's caused by direct warming effects. I'm gonna skip over that. Uh, it's not just um, our data that's showing this. This is um, more broadly, the Department of Natural Resources is finding um, uh, 20 year declines in uh, eelgrass cover in the San Juan Islands and in other locations. So these are this is really important habitat and it and it is diminishing in certain locations. And so um, at the very least, um, better monitoring is needed to be able to pick these up. The work that we're doing now is we're focusing on um, uh, the transmission dynamics and how this disease gets around. And so, for example, we put out sentinel plants in eelgrass beds uh, a little ways, 100 meters from the eelgrass bed, and then uh, 300 meters. And the surprising thing we find is that virtually all these sentinel plants pick up infections. So we know that we're dealing with an agent that has a waterborne mode of transmission. So I'm gonna just go through our take homes for this and then move on to the third part of my talk. Um, uh, we've, we've been able to develop methods for um, studying the phenology or the progression of this disease. Uh, we've developed uh, machine language learning that allows continental scale study. Uh, and what are we finding? We're finding these infections in the field and the lab increase with warming temperatures. Um, we're also finding big declines in our seagrass beds that are related with temperature and disease severity. Uh, and we're finding that these infections are able to transmit um, through, through water. I'm gonna move on. I was gonna leave time for questions, but I think I'm running, running out of time. So I wanna get to this point about how we cool the ocean hot zone. Um, and I'm going to skip over this. Um, um, I'm going to talk about one of the studies that we did in um, Indonesia. This is work that was led by uh, then uh, postdoc Jolie Lamb. She's now a professor. And um, what we were able to show in a series of islands uh, that had lots of raw sewage and bacterial pathogens was that the waters uh, adjacent to seagrass meadows had very low levels of bacteria and those just uh, right next to the seagrass that um, uh, uh, didn't have seagrass had very high levels. That's what all these little red spots are. Um, we replicated this over four different islands. And what you can see is the green line here shows the decrease in the um, the bacteria with distance from shore uh, inside the seagrass meadows compared to outside. So this uh, for indicator bacteria showed a really good indication that these seagrass meadows were somehow detoxifying or uh, removing the bacteria. 
Uh, the other thing that we found is that the levels of coral disease were much lower in seagrass meadows. So this is a black band disease of coral and a white syndrome. And um, the disease prevalence is much higher outside the seagrass meadow than immediately just inside. Um, I don't have time to go through this whole study, but uh, we did an awful lot of work um, including sequencing a whole bunch of um, potentially human pathogens in these same habitats and found the same uh, relationship of a 50% decline in the seagrass meadows. Uh, we've gone on now to do the same thing in um, some of Seattle's waters uh, to sort of examine sort of in a broader context and of course in our own domestic waters, not just in Indonesia, whether some of our nearshore habitats like seagrass meadows um, could be actually reducing the levels of infectious uh, agents. So what we did in this study is we actually put out a bunch of mussels and let them be our passive um, uh, integrators of bacteria, then assess the levels of bacteria and the mussels inside and outside seagrass meadows. And again, found indications there was a lower alert diversity of um, actual human pathogens in these mussels uh, in the seagrass meadows. So these are early days, um, but um, the point I'd like to make is that we're experiencing increasing infectious epidemics causing mass mortality in really important components of our nearshore biota. Climate change is accelerating this disease risk, not just in the oceans, but also on land, although I'm not gonna talk about the land issues. Um, um, and yet, you know, there are ways forward. And I think nature has great power, especially in the ocean, uh, for pathogen reduction. Um, we actually haven't studied it very well. And there's a lot of really important um, new approaches. But let me just give you a few examples of some positive things that happen in natural ecosystems. Uh, we know that natural microbiomes, whether it's in our body or, um, or other organisms, can kill bacteria. Uh, there's a lot of examples where we've developed really interesting um, antibiotic and antiviral drugs from the sea. Um, I didn't talk about this, but we've, ex we've actually logged reduced coral disease inside marine protected areas in more completely functioning ecosystems. Um, I just talked, showed you some data for reduced bacteria in eelgrass. Um, um, there's uh, evidence for even pathogen cleansing and reduction over time in seagrasses. And some of the work uh, that's been published and um, our colleagues are doing now is also show that bivalves also can be filtering out pathogens. So all of these kind of bring us to the, the notion that there really is a frontier here of studying the mechanisms of disease regulation in nature and looking for some in nature's superpowers um, such as seagrass meadows, such as uh, some of the natural bivalves uh, for reducing pathogens um, in nature. And so um, I kind of go into a lot more detail about this in my book, but I don't have time to do that tonight. And I really think I'm about out of time. Uh, so I'm going to just um, conclude with my message that uh, uh, there's evidence that ecosystem services can be improving ocean health. Um, and we really, really want to be focusing a little more on the good things that can be happening in our marine ecosystems to improve health. And no, I didn't just all do this myself. Um, it's been an unbelievable collection of fantastic students, all shown here. Um, many of these, I, I'm really proud of this picture because this was taken in 2015, I think. And virtually every one of these guys is still studying uh, in one way or another um, uh, diseases in the ocean and um, some, of the, some of the linkages with climate. And then these are other colleagues. So I'm gonna stop there.